Good morning. Shabbat shalom. Shalom. Uh, my brother, Deacon Steve, and I wore some different things today so you wouldn't confuse us. All right. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Um, the message I'll be bringing forth today is, again, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. We call it part two. And the subtitle is, Who Do You Trust? Uh, Brother Steve is going to be reading some five passages, and then I will comment on those passages um, with some admonitions to you guys to encourage you. Uh, before I do, I want to acknowledge my daughter, Chanel, who's here in my um, cheering section. Chanel. <clears throat> uh, and then also my fiance, Sharon McDonald, who's back in Orlando, Florida. And um, one more uh, shout out to um, the blind and visually impaired community in Central Florida that I'm leading a group out there. God bless you guys. And finally, to the online community, uh, welcome. God bless you, and thank you for all that you do to support Corner Fringe and staying in touch, even though you're far, you are near and dear to our hearts. Amen. Praise the Lord. Okay, Brother Steve, go ahead. Steve, um, I'm going to read first Matthew 6, 33 to 34, and this is the King James Version. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Next, Jeremiah 17, 5 to 11. Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man, and maketh flesh his arm, and whose heart departeth from the Lord. For he shall be like the heart, the heath of the desert, and shall not see when good cometh, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness in a salt land and not inhabited. Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord, whose hope the Lord is. For he shall be as a tree planted by the waters, that spreadeth out her roots by the river, and shall not see when heat cometh. But her leaf shall be green, and shall not be careful in the year of drought, neither shall cease from yielding fruit. The heart is deceitful above all things, and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I am the Lord, search. I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. As the partridge sitteth on eggs and hatcheth them not, so he that getteth riches and not by right shall leave them in the midst of his days, and at his end shall be a fool. Joshua 21, 45. There failed not aught of any good thing which the Lord had spoken unto the house of Israel. All came to pass. Mark 10, 17 to 27. And when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. Thou knowest the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, defraud not, honor thy father and mother. And he answered and said unto him, Master, all these things I have observed from my youth. And then Jesus, beholding him, loved him and said unto him, One thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come take up the cross and follow me. And he was sad at that saying, and went away grieved, for he had great possessions, and Jesus looked round about and saith unto his disciples, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? And the disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus answereth again and saith unto them, Children, how hard is it for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God? It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And they were astonished out 
They were astonished out of measure, saying among themselves, Who then can be saved? And Jesus looked upon them, saith, With men it is impossible, but not with God. For with God all things are possible. And then lastly, Timothy 6, 17 to 19. Charge them that are rich in this world, that they may not high-minded nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy, that they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. Amen. There you go, sir. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Brother Steve Erickson. I, again, I am uh, Pastor Stephen Opoku. I live in uh, Orlando, Florida where it is much warmer, praise the Lord. But you guys have brought some, what we call Minnesota warm weather right now. So we will be thankful to the Lord for that, amen. Uh, let us uh, have a quick word of prayer. Abba Father, I just pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart would be acceptable to you, O Lord. Father, it is not your will, it's not my will, but thy will, I pray, would be done today as you use me as a vessel unto righteousness for your name's sake. We give you thanks for this opportunity to share your word in Yeshua's name. Amen. Um, I'm going to start off before I get into my first point, uh, sharing with you a story. And we're also going to end with a story. The story begins like this. There was a friend of the family who had been listening to a minister on TV, and they turned to another member of the family, and they said, you know, this minister, he's always just telling stories. Why doesn't he just preach? He's always just tell stories. And the other member of the family turned to them, and I believe this was wisdom, and said to this person who made this comment, have you ever heard of the prodigal son story? Have you heard about the Good Samaritan story? How about the story about the sower sows the word in Mark chapter 4? And they said, these are stories that were told by Yeshua, Jesus of Nazareth in the Bible. He used stories to help explain the word of God. Amen? So I'm going to begin by telling you a story. And you may label me uh, that storytelling Steve, but nevertheless, I don't mind being counted amongst Yeshua's followers. This is actually a true story. And this is how the story goes. There was a woman and her husband that lived in a remote town. And one day they went for a walk. And while they were going for a walk, she made a little misstep off the path. And unfortunately, she was bitten by a water moccasin, which is a type of a snake, very venomous. The husband took her and rushed her quickly with the help of an ambulance to the nearby hospital. The hospital was not able to deal with her because they needed an anti-venom mixture. So they, rushed, they got a helicopter and rushed her to a bigger hospital in the city where they were able to administer anti-venom into her blood and save her life. When she was awake, she asked one of the nurses by her, can you tell me what is the main ingredient in this anti-venom that you guys so wonderfully administered into my body? And the nurse said to her, the main ingredient in this medication is lamb's blood. Let me say it again. Lamb's blood. Amen? Now, let's go back to the beginning. Remember, in the garden, what happened? There was another serpent that came with a deceiving message to Eve. And unfortunately, she fell for it. And because of that, the venom of sin entered into man and separated us from the Lord. 
That's what we call spiritual death. Amen. But about 2,000 plus years later, or much longer, depending on how you chronolize things, there was a man named Yeshua HaMashiach, which John the Baptist referred to as what? The Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Yeshua came, and what did he do? He shed his blood on the cross of Calvary so that by the administration of his blood to whoever would receive it into their spirit, they would no longer be separated from the Almighty God, but they would be redeemed and restored. John the Baptist says, Behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. The same way that lamb's blood took away the venomous poison in that woman's body, the Lamb of God comes and cleanses us from sin. Amen? Isn't it interesting how there's, there's so many examples in the world that, that testify of what God can and does do for us, that there is literally a, a medical example of what a spiritual thing can do for us through Yeshua. Now, I will tell you more about the prodigal son at the end of my story and tell you another story. But as we go into the first point I want to make, we're, we're talking about Matthew 6, 33 to 34. What is the main lesson here in Matthew 6, 33 to 34? What it's saying to us is that a man, a person can have a, man, a person can have priorities in life of either God or money, but not both. And Yeshua, and along with that, Yeshua tells us to, to not have anxiety over what our daily needs are. Our Father in heaven knows what we need. If we would pursue his kingdom and his righteousness, he will take care of our daily needs one day at a time. You know, Worrying about a person's daily needs is one of the main obstacles to trusting the Lord. Let me explain. For example, there's a saying I've always had, if you can do something about your situation, if there's something you can do about it, even if it's just to pray, then don't worry about it. Just do it. Amen? Just do it. For example, Michael Jordan had a commercial way back in the day or uh, with Nike, and he always used to, the, the tagline was, just do it. Just do it. And so if there's something you can do about your situation and God has shown you what to do, just do it. Don't worry. If there's nothing you can do about it, don't worry about it. Amen? So there is no situation that you need to worry the Bible also says, cast your care upon the Lord, for he cares for you. And it says, when you do that, the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds in Messiah Yeshua. But worry is a sin. Do not worry. If there's something you can do about what you're worrying about, go and do it. Take care of it. But if there's nothing, worrying is not going to accelerate the solution of that problem. And, and I think... One of the things when it comes to dealing with situations in life, the first thing you ought to do is to pray. Amen? That is an example of someone who's seeking first the kingdom of God. Whenever a situation comes up in their life, the first thing they do is get on their knees or bow their head, no matter where you are. You can pray even when you're driving on the road. You can pray with your eyes open. Did you know that? <laughs> Amen? You can. The Lord will still hear you, okay? Okay? But just to pray, and prayer is powerful. The fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Prayer is very powerful. And that is the way you, you put your confidence and faith and trust in God and overcome whatever it is that you're going through. But we need to first and foremost put our confidence in God and make him a priority in our lives. You know, one of the ways you can also tell what is a priority in someone's life is what they spend most of their time thinking about. And again, we might say worrying about, but like I said, don't worry. 
what do you spend a lot of time focusing on? You know, God is a mighty God. He's an everlasting father, the prince of peace, king of kings, lord of lords, alpha and omega. There is so much power available in our God. Tremendous power, amazing power. And he is willing to use that power on our behalf. That's why he calls to us. He said, draw nigh unto me and I will draw nigh to you. He is an incredible and amazing. We sing songs. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God, he's an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. And then we get this uh, bill in the mail, and they're like, oh, my God, what am I going to do? What happened to the awesome God? Huh? How quickly you forget. You know, this happened to the children of Israel many times as they traveled from Egypt to the promised land. You know, the miracles, you know, 10 plagues that were happening in Egypt to help make Pharaoh set them free. And they left with gold and silver and just all kind of stuff. And then they got to the Red Sea and that was parted for them. And they saw the, the chariots and the, the armies of Israel destroyed again by the power of God. In the deserts, water came out of the rock, you know, quail, manna, every morning. Every morning, what, every morning, Dunkin' Donuts, right? <laughs> Free of charge, didn't have to go through the drive-thru or nothing. It just came and it tastes delicious, good for you. But then the, when trouble came, when they got to the promised land and they were supposed to go in, they're like, oh, these people are big. They're giants. It's like, uh, who is bigger than our God? Is there anyone bigger than the God who encompasses the whole universe? What does the Bible say? The earth is his footstool, right? If the earth is his footstool, he's massive, very big. And, and what problem do you have in, in that you're living inside the footstool, right, or on it somewhere, and you got this little P problem? He's an awesome God. He can handle it. You can trust him. Amen? Let's go on to Jeremiah chapter 17. What did we learn in the point number two here from that? It says, cursed is the man is the one who trusts in man and the flesh. But blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and, who's, and in whose help the Lord is. You know, the heart is very wicked and deceitful. It will make you work very hard on the wrong things. And at the end, you will look like a fool because you have totally focused on the wrong things in life. It's very wicked and deceitful. It's, it's right at the beginning, it says, cursed is the man whose trust is, cursed is the one whose trust is in man and the flesh. The minute you start trusting in yourself and in the flesh, you literally put a curse on yourself and you're restricting yourself. You can do better than God. No, you cannot. He's more awesome, more powerful, more able to deliver, to save, heal, and to deliver. He is an awesome God. He's a powerful God. And that's why, you know, in this whole lesson, we're talking about seeking first the kingdom of God and putting him first, putting our trust and confidence in him. When we look at a place like Proverbs chapter 3, and I'm looking at verse 13 through 15, it says there, happy is the man that finds wisdom. And it says, it is, the merchandise of it is better than silver, and the gain thereof than fine gold. And then it ends by saying, it is more valuable than rubies, and all the things thou canst desire are not to be compared to it. All the things. How many things? All the things that you can desire are not to be compared to wisdom. You know who possesses wisdom? God. Almighty God. Yeshua HaMashiach. King of kings. Jehovah Jireh, our provider, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It says, 
Happy is the one who, who finds wisdom and gets, happy is the man who finds wisdom and the man that getteth understanding. You will be happy. Do you, anybody, how many people want to be happy? Amen? It's not happy is the one who wins the lotto, right? No. Happiness is not the one who becomes a billionaire, the one who becomes president. God forbid. <laughs> I don't want to be president. It's a lot of headache. Happy is the one that, the man that, get, that finds wisdom and gets understanding. God is wisdom. Wisdom that it's talking about there, it's not just intellect, but it's talking about the God kind of wisdom, the understanding. Have you ever said to yourself, I don't understand? Well, you know who understands? Yahweh. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He understands every situation. Do you know that every scientific discovery was made by him? Every? Yes. Everything. Rocket science is not rocket science to him. Physics, economics, biology, all of it. He made the human being. What did he do? Made Adam out of the ground, breathed into him the breath of life. He understands every body part and how it works and functions. He knows nursing. He knows doctoring, as they would say. He knows carpentry. He understands every occupation, economics, politics. He knows all of it. Omniscient, that means all-knowing. This is the one that I'm encouraging you to, to put first. And he encourages you to put him first. But unfortunately, and we're going to learn about it as we go in this lesson today, many people put their faith and confidence in man or in the flesh. He says, you, you give it your, it's a curse when you do that. You literally limit yourself by putting confidence only in yourself. Now, yes, we know God uses people. But the ones that work best are those yielded to him, that are being directed by his spirit and not by their own intellect. There's a, a proverb that says, there's a way that seemeth right unto man, but the end thereof is destruction. You don't want to be destroyed by using your own intellect, by thinking about things the way you want them. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not unto thine own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. Amen? Now, we'll go on to Joshua chapter 21, verse 45. Now, this is a review also from the last time. What it, you know, this is a powerful statement about how solid and trustworthy the Word of God is. And I, and I brought this verse back again. Why? Because it tells us not one thing the Lord promised the children of Israel failed to come to pass. And he tells us that he is the Lord. I, I am the Lord. I change not. I am the same yesterday and tomorrow. He also tells us that what? I am not a man that I should lie. So if he says something, he will do it. He will watch over his word to make sure it is performed the way that he wants it to be done. So I'm, I'm encouraging you by bringing this verse back again today and saying, look, if he is the same and he doesn't change, we can, be, we can trust him to be just as faithful to us today. Who do you know that is batting a thousand, who, who has never failed? How, you know, you have a best friend who's never failed? You have a brother who's never failed? Any of your relatives, your in-laws, your outlaws? Huh? You know anybody? God is unfailing. He has never failed. He's more than a conqueror. He has overcome. He says, he says be of good cheer. This world, you'll have tribulation, but be of good cheer. Why? Because he says, I've overcome the world. He is an overcomer. And he gives, we've overcome, how? By the blood of the lamb in the word of our testimony. By the blood of the lamb in the word of our testimony. The the encouragement and really the main theme of what I'm trying to get inside of you today is that, look, we have such an awesome God at our disposal. 
Yes, we serve him, okay? He, but yet he's willing to also serve us. We are his servants. We are the sheep of his pasture. But he is, he, look what he did. While we were yet sinners, Messiah died for us. So he's proven his love for us. God so loved the world, John 3, 16, that he gave his only begotten son. Whomsoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. He demonstrates his love for us. While you're yet sinners, Christ, Messiah, died for us. So he's already proven his love for us by dying for us, suffering, a tremendous suffering that happened before he, on Calvary and went to the cross for us. This is his love for us. And, he, and what he's asking us in return is that we make him number one. Make him number one. Seek first the kingdom of God. Put him first. When you put him first, everything else will be in line. Amen? Everything else comes in line. But when you put other things first, and we talked about this last time, when we put other things first, anything that you put as more important than God, whether it be money, we'll talk about that in a minute, a spouse, your car, your home, your children, it becomes an idol to you. What is the first commandment? Thou shalt have no other gods before thee. He's a jealous God. Why does he not want you to have any other gods before him? Because there are no other gods. He is the only God. Behold, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one. There's only one. There's none before him, none after him. None there is. Don't look for another. Another one is not coming. Amen? There is not another God that's going to show up someday and say, Hey, hey, Jesus, Yeshua, step aside. No, no, it's not going to happen. Alpha and Omega, beginning and the end. From everlasting to everlasting, he is God. Look no further. And so he is encouraging us to make him number one because he is number one. Hello. <laughs> he is number one. There is no other. Look no further. And to depend on him with all your heart. When you give all your heart to the Lord, you know what happens? He gives all his heart to you. When you give all your heart to the Lord, then he gives all his heart over to you. But if you, you see, he's a gentleman. Love is not forced on you. Someone will say, well, God is so merciful. He's so kind. You know, why would he just let everybody go to hell? You know, why does, you know, he's, in the end, you know, he's just going to bring everybody up. Listen, if a person lives their whole life and doesn't want to have anything to do with God, avoids God, never goes to church, never reads the Bible, doesn't want to hear anything about religion or Christianity or Yeshua. And then at the end of their life, the Lord snatches them up, you know, and raises them up and brings them. It, 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 that's abuse. <laughs> Amen. Why? Why do I call it abuse? Because you didn't want to have anything to do with them. You choose where you're going, right? But love, just like many of you, you know, maybe in the past there was arranged marriages. I'm, I'm from a culture, I was born in Ghana, West Africa, came here when I was eight years old. And in that culture, many times there's, they arrange marriages, you know, so they decide who your wife is going to be. Hmm. <laughs> okay. Americans land of the free. They'll be like, oh, hold on there, dad. <laughs> Come on. Let me choose. Okay. But that's what we're talking about. In Yeshua, there's freedom to choose. You know, pardon my harsh words, but God is not a rapist, okay? He doesn't force you to love him. That would be rape. God lets you choose. And so if you choose not to serve, then you've chosen to be separated from the Most High God. And he chose to give his life for you, but then you have to choose to accept him. And you have to, once you've accepted him, you now have to choose to make him number one. And that is, again, a choice. But as you do that, he, as you draw nigh to God, he draws nigh to you. He said, seek me early where I may be found. When you, how are you going to find him when you seek him with all your heart? And your love for him 
grows stronger and stronger as you seek him more, as you read and you discover the revelation and the word about him, putting him first day by day. Amen. And now let's talk about something as we go on to my point number three, which um, actually, I'm sorry, the point number four, where we're talking about the rich young ruler. What, what is our takeaway from the, from the rich young ruler? Okay. In the rich young ruler, we learn that, first of all, it is not a sin to be rich. Being rich is not a sin, but putting your trust in Riches in things or money could cause you to lose your eternal life. And Yeshua said this, how hard it is those who trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God. Now, before you say, hey, Brother Steve, I, I'm not rich. What are you talking about? I don't know anything about that. According to stats, if you make 12000 that's that's $1,000 a month or more per year, you have more money and you're richer than over 50% of the world's population. Many people in the third world considered most Americans to be rich. And even when we're talking about wealth in the Bible, that's what we're talking about. Most Americans, according even to the Bible, are in the category of what we call rich, middle, middle class middle income people, even the U.S. itself, our IRS, if you make 26000 or less, is before you're considered poor. And so anybody making 26000 or more per year is considered not poor. So what are you not poor? Then you're rich. Amen? <laughs> okay. Or you're, better, you're doing better than the average person. So in, in, in this example about the rich young ruler, what Jesus was trying to tell him is that, look, he was, and the, and the Lord had discernment to know that he was trusting in riches. And, he, and the disciples were all like, hey, who's going to be able to get in the kingdom of God? Because why? They were also counted. They, you know, Peter had a fishing business with a boat and everything, a couple of boats, partners and all that, you know. So he was doing all right. So he, he's counting. He said, why would they be so astonished? And, and they said they were seriously astonished because, you know, Matthew, he, you know, he was a tax collector. You know, they used to skim off the top. He had a lot of money, too, you know, and others in the group that were not considered poor. So they're like, how are we going to get in the kingdom? And he said, those who put their trust in riches don't trust in riches. If you trust in riches rather than in God, you are putting your eternal destiny in danger. This is not um, uh, 1 Stephen chapter 1, verse 2. This is Yeshua HaMashiach, amen, telling you this, that those who trust in riches, it's difficult. Those who trust in the arm of the flesh, cursed is the man, Curse is the one who trusts in man and trusts in the flesh. And the one who trusts in money. You know, there, money is very deceitful. Again, it comes quickly and can go quickly. You don't, you don't put a trust in it. As I said the other time, the reason it's deceitful is because when you have money, it seems like there's nothing you can't get. And people are deceived into thinking, oh, with all this money, what do I need God for? You know? I can have a beautiful house, a car, education, clothing, and all that. But remember, we talked about this last time, that even Solomon, who was extremely wealthy, if you convert his money to today, he would be still one of the top richest people, if not the richest in all of history. But yet the Lord said he was not even clothed like the lilies of the field. What is that trying to tell us? It's trying to say those who put their confidence, faith, and trust in the Lord God Almighty can be better dressed than even the richest men out there. Because you know what? The Lord is also looking on the heart, not on the outside. We're not talking about, you know, Tiffany's or Macy's or, you know, dressing you up with, you know, gold and silver. We're talking about the glory of the Lord. That is your clothing. Amen? So don't misunderstand me that, hey, you know, if God is going to give you some, you know, 
$2,000 Armani suits and all that. No, I'm not, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about being dressed with righteousness, being dressed with the truth, being dressed with authority and power and just trem- there is man looks on the outside, God looks on the inside. Amen. He's looking on the inside to, to make you rich beyond measure with his wealth. We are joint heirs with Messiah. And what have we inherited? Everything that he is, so are we. He said, as he is, so are we in this world. That's a lot. The creator of the heavens and the earth, Yeshua said to the leaders at that time, I and the Father are one and the same. And they said, hey, blasphemy. Crucify him. But what was he talking about? He was talking about what we could inherit now in him. That's what he went to the cross and died for. I shared with you the other time, you know, I'm from the Ashanti tribe in Ghana, West Africa. And there's a saying we have. It it says, I'll say it in tongues again and I'll interpret it. It says, and yes, some kitwa. And yes, some kitwa, which means it's not a small thing. Again, it's not a small thing what Yeshua did on the cross so that you can come into right relationship with him. So when you come into right relationship with him, and yes, it's not a small thing. It's a mighty thing. So why you have come into this relationship with the almighty God, king of kings, Lord of lords, and you're trusting in the flesh, and you're trusting in man, and you're trusting only in your own intellect. God forbid. Cursed is the man, the one who trusts in man or in the flesh. And, and the thing is, it ta- like it talks about back in Jeremiah chapter 17, you can deceive yourself so easily. Why? Because, you know, you see that the wealthy people, like in Psalm 37, it talks about this. Look at the, the you know, the you know, the wealthy or the wicked, excuse me. It says the wicked, you know, spreading himself like a green bay tree. But then it says, there he was and there he's no more. You know, there he was, today he is, and he'll pass away. There are many wealthy people that we knew of the past. They are no more. And where are they today? Solomon talks about in Ecclesiastes, vanity, vanity, all is vanity. You, you, you create all this wealth, work your butt off, and you leave it for somebody else. Again, have you ever seen on the back of a hearse a big semi-truck full of everybody, their stuff? Is it going to bury it with them? Are they taking it with them? What is that saying? Naked you came, naked you go. Right? You're not taking anything with you. Build treasures up in heaven. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And Again, what we are talking about here is directing you to a mentality, a heart attitude. And you'll see this in my last point in just a minute. There's a heart attitude that the Lord is number one in my heart. In all that I do, he's number one. If you have a job and you're working that job or you have a business, the Lord is top priority there. Because if he's not, you're going to be worried about that thing. Again, worry is a sin. But if God, if you dedicated that business, you've dedicated that job over to the Lord, and he says this company is going out of business, you say, promotion time. Yes? Amen? I know what it's like. I worked out there in industry before I lost my sight for over 25, almost 30 years as a financial controller, um, CFO, as well as even did financial services consulting. And you know, companies came and companies go. I was in charge of billions, not billions, but millions of dollars, as much as a hundred million dollars. And I could see that money just comes and goes. You cannot trust in money at all, but you can trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not unto your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. In that same part in Proverbs chapter 3, it, talks, it, says, it says, fear the Lord and depart from evil. What is evil? What is it referring to about evil there? Fear the Lord and depart from evil. Proverbs uh, 3, 5 through 7 there, the evil it's talking about is you 
leaning on your own understanding. That's evil. Think about it. What we sang a minute ago about how awesome God is, and then you're trusting in your own understanding? Why would you want to do that? You don't want to do that. He, in a sense, he's giving you direction. He's giving you admonition to do what? Do the right thing that is best for you. Like a mother will tell a child, look both ways before you cross the street. Not because the mother you know, wants the, the child to waste a lot of time staying on a corner, but rather doesn't want that child to be hit by a truck. You look one way and, and don't look the other way, that might be the way that a car comes. Looking out for your best interest. Yeshua is looking out for your best interest. He wants you to put your confidence, your faith, your trust in him. Let's look at my last point here, number five. What is in 1 Timothy chapter 6, what is the advice to the rich here? Be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but trust in the living God. And it says, do good, be, and, and be, you know, do good, be good, be rich in good works, be willing to distribute, and also laying down a foundation for the time to come so that they may receive, achieve eternal life. Very interesting here. Do you realize that your heart attitude, how, much, how important your heart attitude about money affects the acquisition of your eternal future? Again, your heart attitude about money will affect your, the acquisition of your eternal future. It is that important. That's how wicked and deceitful money can be. And don't, when somebody comes and says, money is the root of all evil, they're definitely misquoting the Bible, okay? Money is not the root of all evil, okay? Um, the love of money is the root of all evil, amen? The love of money, loving money, you need to love God, not love money. That is the correct quotation. And it says in Timothy that in the love of money, some people having gone after have pierced themselves with all kinds of sorrows. You know, if you ever want to read some bad <laughs> stories, okay, it's a very sad story. It, the, in, and I'm sure it's still there on the internet. They have stories about lottery winners. And if you look at former lottery winners, so many, it's kind of like a, a field of devastation where people who were very poor won the lottery and their whole life was destroyed because of this money. Again, it wasn't the money that destroyed it. It was the love of money and how they handled it. Just told, it's, it's, some, it, it's almost, it would have been better if they had never won. And that is the truth. Now, does that mean God hates money or doesn't want us to be uh, wealthy? No. He wants us to be rich, especially in his word, in wisdom. And he wants us to be able to be blessed, to be a blessing. Amen? We're not here preaching the prosperity gospel. We're here preaching the gospel of Yeshua HaMashiach. Amen? That is the gospel of the Lord. It's good news that he has come to take away the venom of sin from your life. And he's also come to direct your life in a new way not the way of the world. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you might know what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. I said I would wind up at the end here with a story. Let me tell you a story, okay? You're gonna name me Pastor Story, all right, after this. But remember the story of the prodigal son. Now, I'm, in, I'm part of a mighty man's group headed by Andrew Manus of New Hampshire. So Andrew, don't, don't get on my case for this, okay? I'm, paraphrasing the, the, par the parable of the prodigal son for a purpose here. He's very strict when it comes to the scripture, so I got to warn him ahead of time. And um, Adrian is another gentleman out of Canada. He's in our mighty man's group. But let's look at the parable of the prodigal son as I tell my last story. Remember in that story, what happened? The son who was working in the father's house at home told the father 
that he wants all the money that belongs to him. His, he wants his inheritance now. Now, the father's not even dead yet, and he wants the, his inheritance. That's very insulting. It's almost like, you know, why don't you die already so I can get the money, right? But that's basically what he's saying to the father. But the father is very loving, and he understands this is a young man, all kinds of crazy dreams. So the father gives him his inheritance, and he goes off. And he goes living lavishly, spending money on drinking and all kinds of crazy living until he runs out. And then he goes to get a job feeding some pigs. And um, he's not allowed to eat pork, so he can't eat the pigs. <laughs> okay. Um, clean living. Amen. Clean eating. And he's like, man, these, even these pigs got something to eat. I don't, I'm starving. If I could just go back home, you know, I could do what? I could even be a servant for my dad. And the servants there, they always got plenty of food to eat. You know, they're not starving. Now, let me back up a second. Remember, in this story, the son was doing what? He was working in the father's house. But why was he thinking about getting his inheritance? Because you know what? He was not really serving the, the father. He was serving. He was thinking about himself, selfishness. He was not putting the things of the father first. This is what caused him to have this thinking that, hey, I just want my money and I'm going to hit the road. Follow me. So he gets to this place where even the food that the pigs are eating looks delicious to him. Uh, that's a pretty low level. Okay. Then he decides to head back home. Maybe the dad will let him be a servant in the house and then at least he'll have something to eat. The father sees him afar off and goes running to meet him and puts on his own robe, puts on the ring of authority. Now, what is happening here? Before he even gets to the house, the father who's been waiting for him to come back receives him, accepts him, loves him. This is the revelation I want you to catch from this. The son had not yet come back home. He had not started serving the father even the way he intended to, to be one of the father's servants. But the father saw something. And again, I want you to think of the heavenly father, because that's what this story is talking about. The father saw in the son a change in his attitude. There was already a repentant heart that had turn from serving himself like he was thinking about before he asked for his inheritance. And now he says, I want to serve the father. Before he even stepped into the father's house to become a servant or do anything, the father put on the robe, gave him the ring. Do you see what's happening here? The father God is looking for a heart attitude change for you to repent of serving yourself and serving God. If we would have a repentant heart, a heart that says, God, not my will, but thy will be done. That I want to serve you with all my heart. That I want not just to be part of the household of God, but I want to serve the Lord. Remember Yeshua when he was with his disciples, what did he say? The greatest among you will be your servant. He washed their feet to show that example. The greatest among you. Who is the greatest servant of all? Is it not God himself? Think of all the people in this world that God is serving on a daily basis. So when he talks about the greatest, he's really talking about himself. And if we are to emulate him, we are to be the same. And you know, again, because he had a heart attitude change to serve God now, what happened? He got the royal robe of his father's robe. Think about God himself, Yahweh creator of the heavens, and putting on the robe, his robe, his ring. You see the correlation we're trying to make here? There's an earthly example Yeshua was talking about, but he was talking about the Father, the God of the universe, giving you his robe because you choose and have chosen to serve him and not yourself, to put him first and not your own selfish gains. And giving you his ring, which, which that when the, with the one who has that ring has the authority. All authority in heaven and earth has been given unto me. Go ye therefore. Amen. Amen. 
Powerful revelation. Just because of a heart attitude change, even before he started doing anything, the Lord honored him. The Father honored him with that. Again, like Paul tells Timothy, don't put your trust in riches. Like Yeshua told the young, rich young ruler, he was sad because he couldn't change his mind, couldn't change his heart. Don't be like the rich young ruler. Be like his disciples who continued to follow him, who changed their heart, who changed their attitude, who repented of self-serving and decided to serve the living God, to put him first and to be clothed with his role, to have his authority. You know, heaven and earth will pass away, but his word will not pass away. In the end, every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Yeshua, Jesus, is Lord. There are so many things in this world that are captivating, the things of this world that are captivating people's minds and attentions. And we're looking at Hollywood and the politicians and we're thinking, oh, this is, uh, you know, all this stuff. It's not good. In the end, they're going to pass away. But his word will not pass away. There are riches, treasures in heaven that we are to build towards. Those treasures will not pass away. Amen? And that's what he's saying. Seek first the things of God's kingdom and his righteousness, his way of doing things, because those things will not pass away. Don't build up treasures on earth, temporal things, things that will not last, that moth and rust does corrupt. Build up treasures in heaven by doing the things according to his word that build his kingdom, serving the Lord. And you will be clothed with his robe, the robe of righteousness, with his authority. The authority that's above all the principal. We are seated in heavenly places in Messiah Yeshua, far above all principalities and powers and rulers of darkness. One last thing as I conclude. Listen. The greatest position you can have in this universe, not just this earth, is to be a servant of the Most High God. There are people that would give the right arm to maybe serve a president or a prime minister or a king or a mayor or a governor. But how many of those people compare to the Almighty God? None of them even come close. All the things that thou desire are not to be compared to the living God. He told Joshua, choose this day whom you will serve. So as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We will seek first the kingdom of God. We will trust the Lord with all our heart and lean not unto our own understanding. In all our ways, we will acknowledge him and he will direct our paths. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Let us pray.